Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, it's crazy to think we're deep into June already. We're almost in the second half of the year. And today we have a ton of amazing new things to share with you. So um, Dana is going to um, share a lot of brand new information around where people are actually going to eat. And uh, it's pretty mind blowing stuff. We're also going to look at the latest that's going on with industry recovery. But today's going to be a bit more of a data heavy uh, episode. And uh, we would invite you to ask as many questions um, in chat or throw your comments on things. Uh, we promise that we made the charts large enough that you're not you know, leaning forward and squinting or anything like that. But we are going to throw a few more numbers at you than normal, but we promise it will be, uh, they'll all be very, very interesting numbers. So with that, um, again, please hit chat, let us know where you're coming in from. And if you feel so inclined, share with everyone the best thing you had to eat this past week. Uh, it's all about this community that we formed and, uh, and that chat, I actually love reading the chat out of these things are done. There's just so much insightful stuff in there. So um, tell us where you're clicking in from, best thing you had in the past week if you feel inclined, but really just say hi to all your friends and colleagues throughout the food industry. Um, as, a remember, uh, as a reminder, make sure you choose all panelists and attendees uh, when you do this. It's the best way of making sure everyone sees things. And uh, Dana, before we get fully started, um, I guess hearing from you all the time on just what life is like on the street in New York has been so dramatically different than the experience that I've had in, in Tennessee, uh, for example. Um, have you visited Florida in the last couple of months, or is this going to be sort of you know, culture shock when you get there? No, I, I visited and I spent the first half of the like March to March to August there. So how would you characterize? Oh. Yeah, well, how would you characterize the differences or similarities in COVID attitude between New York City and Tampa, Florida? Well, obviously, I think everyone's attitudes have changed a lot over the twelve months, which we certainly see in our data. Yeah. Um, I I do think that like space affords you like different yeah. different levels of 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 what you know what are you afraid of like i have to ride in an elevator to walk my dog at least three times a day so um i think life is a little different here uh, than it will be in in just in less dense places so i think density and we see also with in terms of what customers are doing density really is sort of the thing that seems to change behavior more so, I mean, at the beginning of COVID, people started spreading out a little bit more. You know, you didn't want to be within six feet of someone else. Like you could actually see that dynamic on the street as people sort of had a bubble around them and sort of avoided other people. Are you seeing that personal space sort of, you know, come back into a, a normal distance now or you still have that protective bubble that people are walking around in? So in Florida, like, if I, you know, in a suburb, if you went on a walk, people just walked on the other side of the street or like walked around you six feet. In Europe, yeah. that never really happened, at least not to me. You couldn't before. do it. You couldn't do it. So you just wore a mask and you did what you would have done normally. And people I mean, were always as close as they ever were. Like they didn't sort of, you know, it angle around like, the other person. Yeah, it felt like the same thing just with a mask on, to be honest. I, I mean, the trains were less crowded. So on a subway, I think while you always sort of spread out, maybe the spreading out was a little felt a little more intentional. Yeah. Are subways anywhere near normal yet, or is that still totally different? I personally have been on some crowded trains, but they don't feel normal to me, no. But also, I'm not commuting every day as I used to. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I have the best read on what they're like at rush hour. But Yeah, that'll be interesting to watch as well. Um, well, with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'd like to challenge um, everyone here to, over the course of the next, what, Two days. So by um, by tomorrow, can you find three colleagues that you can invite to register for this webinar series? We'd like to continue growing this if we can. And the best way to get them to register is just invite them over to the datacentral.com homepage. There's a big black button that says don't miss our biweekly webinar. They can click it, they can register, and they will be um, registered for all the future ones as well. So the magic number is three. Try to think of three people you know you work with, either at your company or another. Um, that's in the food industry. We want to keep this to food professionals and invite them to come in. And we promise it'll always be interesting, informative, and hopefully entertaining content as well. 
Uh, I was going through old emails um, uh, a few days ago. You know, it's almost like cleaning out your closet. You know, you stumble on some old emails. And I, I came across this one. It's actually a bulk email that we'd sent out in March of last year on the 13th, sort of that first week that COVID really became a holy crap sort of a moment. And it basically said, hey, you know, that's been a, a week for the ages, you know, one breaking news story after the next. Uh, we're going to commit to providing the industry with some really helpful insights to get us through this moment. Uh, and we're going to do it uh, free of charge for the industry. And you can see that over the next few days, you know, we did report number one, COVID report number two, COVID report number three, um, all done uh, free of charge. And the thinking back then was like, maybe we do this for three or four weeks because um, we didn't realize all the twists and turns that this thing was going to take and how important it would be to continue having insights that were up to date throughout this entire period. We didn't know it was going to be this long. We, we just really didn't, right? So when we made that commitment, we thought it was sort of a more short-term commitment. So we basically did is we took a big chunk of our staff and we said, you know what? Work on this stuff and we're not going to get paid for it, but that's okay. We're here to support the industry that supported us. For so long and here we are 100 reports later um, 15 months uh, later and uh, we've published a lot of material since then uh, i just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and say thank you to all the people actually at data essential this time that have worked on this really impressive series of reporting it's been a lot of work and frankly it's not easy asking people to drop what you're doing work on this other thing knowing that we're not going to get paid for it and to do it uh, you know, with all of the energy and excitement and passion that we have for any other project. So um, thank you to the Data Central team. We built a really great resource, I think, for the industry. Uh, and uh, you know, the team deserves some real credit. So thank you, guys. OK, so with that, I'm actually going to use that as a segue into something that I wanted to show you all real quickly. We're going to keep this really, really fast. Um, two days ago, we debuted uh, in our platform something called Report Pro. And basically what, we, what Report Pro is, is it's a, a way of having unlimited access to all of the amazing reports that Data Essential does. It's you know the, not just the COVID reports, which we made totally free, but a, up to about a thousand other reports on every other topic imaginable. It's sort of like a giant all you can eat buffet of incredible insights that's all presentation ready, ready to use. It's really fantastic. And I wanted to show you what this looks like real quick. So let's do maybe a, a one minute exploration of this thing that we call Report Pro. And I'll let you sort of do the rest of the discovery yourself when you actually get a chance to log in and play with the tool a little bit. So uh, here's the Report Pro interface. I think my screen share is working. Can you see this, Dana? Nope, nope I can't. Oh, so let me stop share. And I'm going to share out my entire screen now. Let's just share out the whole desktop, I guess. Oh, actually, we can do this. Now you should be able to see something. How about that? Yeah. So um, here's Report Pro. It's basically a fantastic way of just browsing, um, again, about a thousand different reports with brand new reports every single week on an all you can eat basis, unlimited access to all the things that we do. So we have, you know, new releases. Here are a bunch of reports that we've written in the month of May. Um, all the trend curves we do, these menu adoption cycles. Of course, all the complimentary COVID stuff going back all the way to last year. Um, food bites, reports on global foods and flavors, um, trends all around. We have these things called inspiration boosters, which are things to jumpstart your inspiration or innovation project that you might be working on in any category. If you're on the retail side of things, there's a ton of material there for you. We have quick reads on all these topics you would probably curious about, but you never thought that it made sense to do a full research study on. So we've done it for you, whether it's nutritional supplements, sustainable seafood, or dozens of other topics deep dives into various food service venues, um, big picture thought leadership pieces, what's going on with technology and food, adult beverage, um, all these different packages that give you everything that you want. And it goes on and on, plant-based, sweet eats, comfort foods. I'm gonna go back to the top real quick. Oh, I think I clicked on something I didn't mean to. I did not mean to click on Washington DC, but I guess that's good as anything else. I'm gonna go back home for a moment. And uh, all you do is you click on the report you're interested in. Let's find one that's interesting. Let's look at this one. There's one on tacos. I'll click the taco report. And uh, you could download it, right? Or you could hit read and um, you could actually read the reports in system as well.
but these are all designed to be totally presentation ready. So if you're going into an innovation session around tacos, in this case, it's all here for you. It's done for you. And there's like a thousand of these things in here. So we'd invite you um, to log in a snap uh, if you're a Data Central user already. Uh, you could check out Report Pro and then come talk to us about a particular Report Pro package that might be interesting to you. There's just a ton of amazing information. And again, it's all ready to go. So uh, we'll do a deeper dive in the future, but I know we want to get on to the main material. So I'm going to stop the share and restart the share of our PowerPoint. So uh, there are three flavors of Report Pro. Trend Pro is all about innovation. Insights Pro is all about people and changing consumer behavior and big issue topics. And Food Service Pro is all about different types of food service operators, what's happening with them, what they care about, what they think about, how they buy, et cetera. And these, again, this is unlimited access. Choose the package that makes sense for you and unlock hundreds, if not thousands of reports. So one of the things that um, we've looked at as part of this webinar series in the past is what's happening with restaurant openings and closings. And we do that through a tool we have called Firefly. Uh, Firefly tracks every place that serves food in the US and Canada. And as part of that tracking that we've started for COVID, every week we're collecting information on new restaurant openings as well as closures. And we learn a lot from that information. And I wanted to share some of the things that are happening more recently. So I have two lines on the screen right now. We're looking at just restaurants and we're looking specifically at US data in this case from our Firefly data set. The green line represents the number of new restaurant openings, not reopenings of places that were closed by COVID, but brand new first time openings. That's the green line. The orange line are permanent closings, not temporary closings where they close down for COVID and then reopen later, but places that shut down for good. And if we go back a few years to 2018, this, the data actually goes back further than that, but we're gonna look at just the last three years so we don't have too much squinting to do. You can see that sort of in that 2019 year, it was sort of a, a time of um, restaurant expansion in the US. The green line is higher than the orange line. More places were opening than were closing. But as we got into 2020, and then much more abruptly as we got into COVID, we entered a period of contraction that still actually continues on till today. For every month since the start of COVID and for a couple of months actually prior to COVID, we had more restaurant closures than we had openings. Now the degree of contraction looks like it's shrinking. We're starting to see more new openings happen. Um, as of right now, for every one place, uh, for every one place that opens, there's typically about three to four places that are closing. Well, we think that ratio is going to start returning back to normal. And the question is, what does this mean for the actual universe of restaurants that exists? Here's the basic math. There are about 760,000 restaurants that existed pre-COVID. About 90,000 of them have closed permanently. About 12,000 other restaurants have opened in that same time since COVID, which brings us to a restaurant universe today of about 698,000 a net reduction of about 65,000 restaurants or about 8.6% uh, of the total universe prior to COVID. So 8.6% of restaurants, uh, no, maybe a better way to say it, our, our total restaurant universe today is about 8.6% smaller than it was at the start of COVID. And you can see how the math sort of works out. The question is, is that 8.6% number the same, you know, uh, regardless of whether you're a chain or an independent? Is it the same for you know, QSR as it is for fine dining? Well, the answer is clearly no. And you can see what that 8.6% looks like for these other you know, restaurant groupings. Food trucks have been hit hardest overall. We've had a 20% contraction in the number of food trucks in the US since COVID, inclusive of brand new openings as well. Um, for QSR and fast casual, those limited service restaurants, um, that unit count has not declined as much that there's sort of more in that seven to high sevens range. And you can see for fine dining, the number is more like an 11. What's really interesting though, is the chain breakout. The national chains have been more resilient to closures than other types of restaurants have, but it's not the independents that have closed on net the most. The, the, the biggest downside unit chain we've seen is actually seen with regional chains, you know, sort of those five, maybe 10 unit chains that are in just a couple of markets where there's been a 13% decline in total restaurant 
locations. <clears throat> so that's sort of what the universe looks like. And the question we want to ask now is, well, if that's what the restaurant universe looks like and how that's changed, where do people actually go, right? Where, not, not just what restaurants are open, but where are people actually going to eat? And how has that evolved over the last year plus? So this is actually a question that we try to answer in general a few years ago. And, we, uh, and the, the aim is to do it with GPS data, which is the best way of actually answering this question. So you could take um, information that's tracking where people's cell phones are going with a very, very high degree of locational accuracy. And if you look at that data, you could say, oh, we're seeing a lot of people going you know, to this restaurant or to that restaurant, or that the uh, migration patterns from home to certain restaurants looks a certain way. And a few years ago, we actually tried to do this. And the way we try to do this is by working with another company that would send us aggregated GPS data. You know, it would say, um, here's what traffic to McDonald's overall looks like for the US, or here's what traffic to Wendy's looks like uh, in this particular, in the LA market, for instance. <coughs> and it's great. But when we started looking at that data a little bit more closely, you know, it was aggregated already by the time it got to us. Uh, we started seeing some things in it that seemed a little strange and there were questions in it that we couldn't quite answer and it wasn't that there may not have been a good answer it's just that we would have no idea because the data was already aggregated right maybe you know were there wendy's inside that report that weren't actually wendy's or that were actually closed locations or that got misattributed to another chain instead we had no idea there's no way of keeping that stuff clean um so we put that entire project on, on the shelf for a couple of years. Uh, during COVID, we thought it'd be a good idea to maybe dust that project off and see if there's a better way of doing this where we're not relying on aggregated data, where we can get something far more granular and actually do that cleaning ourselves to make it perfect. So Dana's part of the team that actually dusted that thing off the shelf. And um, we're now bringing in granular trip level data, device level data, so quite literally, this particular phone or device went to this particular restaurant at this particular time. Um, millions of consumers represented across the US, hundreds of millions of restaurant trips a year at the device level. With that, we can do a heck of a lot more. So we take that device level information of where people are going, we then apply it and cleanse it with Firefly. So Firefly helps us understand, is that place really a Wendy's? What are the hours of operation that it's open? Um, what's on the menu at that Mexican independent restaurant? Does it have a drive through Does it have an outdoor patio? We learn all these other things about those places. And when we combine those two things together, you get cleaner data and we have something new that we're gonna call Go. Go is gonna be forthcoming. What we wanted to do today is preview some of the really impressive things we've learned from this Go data as it relates to the pandemic and what restaurant recovery looks like and where things are headed in the future. So as an example, um, you know, let's look at December of 2020, right? Nationwide, this is what daily restaurant visits look like. You can sort of, can you see my mouse when I wiggle this thing around, okay. right? You know, higher traffic on the weekends, that's what these little bumps are over here. And then all of a sudden, you know, much less traffic uh, on Christmas, right? Makes total sense. And it got Dana and I thinking, like we actually were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, is that whole thing about, you know, Chinese restaurants being really busy on Christmas, is that actually true or is that just sort of a myth? And so, I told back it was certainly true because I do it all the time. So sample size of one though. In sample that size case. of one though, yes. And the question is what happens when you take the sample size of one and make it a sample size of millions, do we still see that truth emerge? So here actually is, that data. So for the month of December 2020, these are visits to Chinese restaurants. This is the market share of Chinese restaurants versus all other places to eat. So typically, you know, the market share for Chinese restaurants is sort of in that 2.5, 2.6% range, but it climbs to something, you know, clearly over 4% um, on December 25th for a Santa index of 161. So I guess it is higher. I'm actually, I was actually surprised it wasn't higher than, even than that. Dana, were, were you, or did you think it was gonna be just a little bit of a pop? You know, I, I 
I don't know what I thought it would be, but I was excited to see that it happened. I think in my experience, um, I go to like packed Chinese restaurants on Christmas and I'm used to like, I've even been sat with other people because they were so crowded. They were like, will you sit with those other people who aren't taking up the large table? And so yeah. I've shared, I've shared a, a, you know, 10 top with people I'd never met before. So I expected that sort of feeling of density that I feel when I go to a Chinese right. restaurant. Right. And then, but then what happens when you think about it is, is you went to an open Chinese restaurant. That's right. Not all Chinese restaurants are open, which is why you don't see the tremendous spike. But I actually got angry a little bit when I saw this. I'm like, damn, I was hoping for it to be like a three or 400 index. So I said, what if we just look at New York City? It's got to be a lot higher, right? And here's actually the number for New York City. So certainly a bigger number, but not a dramatically larger spike than we see otherwise, but the pattern generally holds true as yeah. well. So we're just trying to show you a little bit of what this data can do before you go into the COVID metrics. And I'm going to ask you all uh, to put your thinking caps on. This is daily restaurant traffic uh, from what December until you know just recently. Which US city is this, right? You see the big drop in traffic on the 25th of December, as you would expect to see. But that week of February 14th, you see a massive, massive drop in traffic and it's not valentine's day right the valentine's day would actually give you should give you the opposite effect of that but this particular city and there's others that are like it so you'd probably just be in the general um uh you know ballpark and that would be okay but this particular city had a massive decline in that week uh any guesses are we seeing anything pop up in chat dana yeah. so we've gotten some some correct guesses i would say and some some a little bit off the mark yeah so uh for all you correct guessers, congratulations. It is, in fact, the winter storm in Houston. So it's actually becomes really interesting if you think about the granularity of data, what you could learn as you have far more data to utilize. You could look at things like individual cities or even individual zip codes on a specific day or during a specific hour, right? Far more accurate and finite reporting than was ever available. So the question is, what does this tell us about COVID? What does the road ahead look like, so to speak? as we recover the, from the pandemic. Where are we in the recovery compared to where we started? Well, I mean, Dana, do you wanna to talk to us about where we are in terms of just restaurant traffic overall? Yeah, so on an overall basis, it looks like we're doing okay. And it really looks like the spring brought what we were hoping and expecting that it would, which is a bit of a return to near normalcy. Um, now, one thing about all these slides is that we're going to be looking at a lot of May compared to January. So you'll see in, in some of these examples that there are times where May compared to January is like a bit of a of a tough comp. Uh, but in this case, I think we're seeing that we're get we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like you know, basically by the time we got into early mid March, we started doing fairly well, and it's been uphill uh, continuously. Actually, someone correct me on this. It's down. Even though the chart is going up, you're actually going downhill because that's easier. So it's been an okay. improvement since mid-March, I should say. On a segment-specific basis, here's what the data shows. And to make things a little bit easier, we put these sort of um, dashed lines over this, this like uh, other horizontal line over here to show you where things were at the beginning uh, of January on average. So you could compare that to the end point of where we were just last week at the end of May. Yeah. And QSR, on average, has more traffic today than it did at the start of 2020 pre-pandemic. Casual dining hasn't fully recovered yet. You can see that pink line for casual dining. It's below that you know, uh, 2020 beginning number. And certainly, uh, mid-scale hasn't recovered. Neither is fast casual. Uh, and I didn't draw the long horizontal line for fine dining because it would basically just overlap the other one and be really hard to see. But fine dining is still significantly below where it was. Is there any other observation you would have here, Dana? No, uh, the only other thing that I think is interesting is if you look at the shape of the dip on QSR, I think you see a much tighter dip than you see yeah. with some of the other ones. And of course, if we did, if we were able to zoom in on fine dining, it has the widest of all of them, which sort of makes sense given the, the baseline format um, compared to even the COVID adjustments that folks might have made. So if you look at those segments and here we've sort of tried to index things. So we've color coded things based on how strong traffic is relative to the first, uh, the first month of 2020 relative to January, 2020. 
And you can see, um, you know, first four weeks of, uh, of January 2020 at the top of the chart, going all the way down to, you know, the end of May at the bottom of the chart. And you can sort of see where the tough areas are, right? So um, I'm going to sort of magnify this a little bit and show you those first several weeks where, you know, 100 index means that your traffic was about the same as it was at the beginning of 2020. And as the numbers get lower, it means your traffic is getting much worse compared to where you were before. So things got, you know, really obviously very, very tough for some of those uh, full service segments. And in particular, fine dining got down to an index of like a 25 on a national basis. Casual dining got down an index of about a 33. But largely, much of this is recovered. And if you look at the chart on the left, we're starting to see a lot more green now, uh, with the exception of fine dining, which is still sort of in that yellowish, not quite, quite green zone. But just remember how severe this was at some point in time, that it was like a 75% WAP um, compared to where things were pre-pandemic. But what does this mean for market share, right? So if you look at the numbers before COVID became a thing, QSR has represented about 47% of all restaurant visits. Fast casual is 12.5%, mid scale is 15.5%, casual dining 23.9%, et cetera. Right? This is the market share. If you add all the numbers up, you get to 100. The question is, how do these numbers shift over time throughout the pandemic? Uh, well, let's look at QSR first. This pink line is QSR's market share during the pandemic. And you start seeing pretty clearly that this thing just shot through the roof. Uh, I mean, you never see share changes like this. I think perhaps in, you know, uh, our lived history of restaurants for the last, you know, 60 years or something, you never would have seen anything like this, where the share jumped from 45% to nearly 60% in just a couple of weeks before returning back and then normalizing to something in the high 40s and sometimes over 50, but still better than where QSR had been historically. And I think to your point, Jack, since these are really hard numbers to move, that is a, that is a, you know, four percentage points here is a big deal. Yeah, it's it's really hard numbers to move, and there's been a sustained move, right? I mean, it's it's been quite remarkable. Um, a lot of numbers uh, here, so I'm going to walk us through them real fast. The point to make, though, is actually pretty simple. So each one of these lines represents a different type of restaurant, right? Different restaurant segment, and you could see um, how that's sort of trended over time since the beginning of COVID to, to, to basically just last week. And you can see what its market share for that segment was pre-COVID, what its lowest market share was during COVID, what the highest market share it had during that time, and where it is currently um, right now. And you can see, you know, again, those really big jumps for QSR. But the key point is what's up today and what's down today on net. QSR is up and all the other segments on a market share basis are um, flat if you're fast casual or down a little bit if you are those other segments. But you can see real interesting is the QSR jump, the spike happens in concert with infection waves. First wave, big spike. Second wave, another spike that you see for QSR as well. And of course, a corresponding dip in places like casual dining. I mean, I don't know, is there anything you wanna to add to that Dana or? No, I think it's really interesting that consumers are modifying their behavior and, and without having to tell us about it, we're able to understand those modifications and we're able to correlate them to what we know is happening in the world. Yeah. So, you know, uh, God forbid if, if another wave happens, expect another QSR bump, essentially. So I wanted to disclaim some of the additional information you're about to share with us, Dana, that uh, this is subject to seasonal trends. Right, some parts of the country are hot during the summer. Some parts of the country are really nice during the summer. We're going to show monthly data at this point, so just know that, you know, there's some parts of the U.S. you don't want to be at in in August. Actually, I think Dana, you and I are both moving to those types of places in the next month or so. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so keep in mind there are seasonal trends in this data, and it's all based on weather. Um, what can you tell us about just? big swaths of the country, the nine census regions. 
Yeah, so what I think is, is super interesting here is if you look at some of the charts that are doing the best relative to January of 2020, um, those tend to be places that have really nice summer weather. So that's New England, what the census calls West North Central, which is like the Dakotas and Minnesota and areas like that. And then at the bottom, uh, the Pacific area. So this is California and Washington, Oregon. What, what's really interesting there is that um, they had uh, during their second wave, a lot of reclosures and yeah. sort of revision of lockdown. And that has even slowed their recovery a bit, it seems. Yeah, would you say that the the lower numbers we're seeing for Pacific as a big region overall is not so much weather based today? A lot of it's uh, the aggregation of sort of a lot of policy stuff. Over I, the certainly, time. I certainly think the dip in the winter shouldn't have been weather related, just given the weather in the area. Yeah. Um, so I, I would go I would go out on a limb saying that um, it does seem like everybody sort of needs time to recover from their lockdowns. And so it could be as simple as that. Um, there's also been some stories about people moving. So it would be yep. curious or interesting to understand and correlate this data with some of that as well. And some tourism as well, certainly. To totally, um, which I don't, I don't recall. We'll see it in a moment, but um, tourist areas do, do seem to have struggled a bit more and stayed uh, at depressed traffic levels for a bit longer, which makes sense. So the thing that we start learning from this is that this is a really, it's a, it's a global pandemic, but the impact is really local. And we just looked at big super regions, which are frankly still giant pieces of the country. And the thing I'd like to impart is that's actually not the story. The story becomes much clearer and into focus as we get more local and more local and more local. So let's go from region of the country to something like geographic types, right? You have urban, you have suburban and you have rural. And this is a pretty dramatic change that we've seen. Do you wanna take us through some of the shifts that we see in this chart? Yeah, so what's really interesting is that urban and suburban were getting pretty similar levels of traffic before the pandemic began. And they also experienced a pretty similar dip, but the recovery in suburban areas has been way more powerful than it has been in urban areas. And that in and of itself, I think is, is really interesting and telling. Somebody in chat was saying it's the drive-through. So we actually have the ability to look at some of those cuts uh, by combining our Firefly data with this data. So we're excited to be doing that um, down the line. We haven't done that for you today though. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is, is rural on a tear. I think um, that might be an unexpected outcome of, of COVID is that people are moving farther and farther away from cities. So you see urban to suburban, maybe you also see some suburban to rural. And as you see that migration, there might be actually more demand for restaurants than supply in some of those areas. That is absolutely our theory. And if, if you look at the, I mean, look at how big the difference was between the green and the blue line between rural and urban at the beginning of 2020 and how minuscule that difference has become today. Uh, it, it, it really is something. And I, I would invite you all, if you haven't downloaded it yet, check out our dual migration white paper, which talks about migration patterns in the country, what it means specifically for food and innovation. And I think, Dana, you're absolutely right. We're going to see more interesting rural restaurants than we ever have before because of that, uh, precisely because of it. So I'm not saying Tampa is rural or anything like that, but no, it's better restaurants everywhere. Tampa probably still, most of Tampa and probably the area I'm moving to still would qualify as urban by yeah. this definition. So this, this definition is census-based and, and and based on the actual density of housing. And if you look at sort of the, the numbers, net 6% drop in traffic in urban areas, 6% gain in rural areas, and suburban has had a little bit of an uplift as well. So spaghetti chart, you're not gonna be able to read this, um, but you're not supposed to have to be able to read it. We summarize some of the key things for you. Here are on an index basis, so 100 means that your traffic is just as strong at the end of May as it was at the beginning of 2020. Um, and if it's above 100 means you're even stronger. But here are some of the ones that have, let's say the lowest index at the end of May, just a, just a week or so ago, versus the beginning of 2020. California, DC, and Hawaii. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have Alaska, Maine, and South Dakota. So certainly some of this could be driven a little bit by, you know, 
where you're located and what the weather is like. Uh, but do you have another observation for us, Dana, on the disparities that we see? Yeah, I think that I think with respect to Alaska, I think it's hard to argue that you wouldn't want to be out more a bit in May than in, summer, in yeah. January. And also the population probably swings a bit too. Um, but on the lower end of the spectrum, I think a couple of people were mentioning in chat what we know did happen. Lots of lockdowns for major metro areas in California that happened. Um, DC, I think, just had a bit of you know tumultuous year, let's say. And then Hawaii has done a great job of keeping out the COVID um, and, and They've also executed that by making it a bit harder to get there. Um, and so you certainly see that that's, you know, had a meaningful impact on restaurant traffic. Yeah. But you'll see as we get, uh, when we'll give you all about 20 seconds to locate your state on this chart, if you're interested to know where you are today versus pre-pandemic times. But we're, we're going to start seeing as we get more and more local from, you know, from regions to states to, you know, area types and to individual metros the disparities start to grow larger and larger and larger. New York, Chicago, and LA, the three biggest uh, metro areas in the country, right? So despite all the headlines uh, in and around New York at the start of the pandemic, um, it's essentially at a point of basically recovery today for the New York metro, right? For the, for the broader New York metro. Chicago is getting pretty darn close, but LA still has some ways to go. And that's one of those things that's dragging down that Pacific line um, that we saw earlier. And I thought this was really interesting what was put together here, which is um, these are the top 50 metros uh, in the US. We have this for all 200 plus metros, but you can't really fit it on a slide, unfortunately. And this, this is sort of that restaurant index that we're looking at. So, you know, if you're nice and green, that means you're right back to where, you know, where you were when you started, but you start seeing differences from city to city, right? So take a look at LA, for instance, it's had a pretty long continuous streak of red and orange, even leading up into today, Honolulu, because of tourism and, you know, not letting as many people in, it's been red for a really, really long time. Or you look at something like Las Vegas, for instance, which had a really long streak of orange going all the way down, but it's starting to actually improve and if you probably look at you know data two weeks or three weeks from today which we can do it's probably gonna look pretty green at that point then i look at where i am and i in nashville and i'm like holy crap i've had a really different experience than the rest of the country you have like what a few weeks of orangish colors then it just goes straight to yellow and back to green basically again uh so again we've all had really different experiences depending on where we live in particular, we should all remember that, right? The things that we're experiencing are probably pretty different than um, our, our other colleagues around the country. Um, was there anything else that you saw here that you think was worth calling out, Dana? No, I, th I think that those were the the bulk of what we talked about uh, or what we see in it. I think just the the depth of red is sort of, you feel, you, you're, you feel for the people who are in those cities and how much their lives may have changed. Yeah, it's scary when you're, if you're in one of those red red tiles, it's probably sort of scary time. I thought this was interesting too, and I apologize, I sort of just added this um, last uh, last moment. And uh, I'm actually going to skip over this and we're going to come back to it at the end if we have time. Uh, I wanted to actually go into something even more local than that. And we're, we're getting more and more local. We're seeing bigger and bigger disparities. disparities. Can you talk to us about Chicago specifically? Yeah, so our our office, our headquarters is in Chicago. It's not just in Chicago, it's in the loop. So we thought it would be interesting uh, to have a look at how different life is like in the loop um, than it has been at other times. You know, there are a number of large cities in the US that are interesting to look at, uh, but one thing that makes Chicago unique is that it really has this very tight centralized downtown. So of course there are businesses other places, but the loop really is a very heavy commercial area. So we wanted to have a look um, at, at exactly what that means for restaurants that are located in these central business districts. So first we zoomed out on the entire DMA and we did the same traffic index uh, that we did uh, on the prior slides comparing to, um, to January of 2020. And we find all these, all these um, mostly suburban and rural 
counties that are part of the Chicago DMA. And then all the way on the right-hand side, you see Cook County, which is where Chicago is located. And, and we see discrepancies by rural, suburban, and urban areas inside right. the greater Chicago metro. That's right. So then we wanted to go a little bit farther and get in on some of the, the specific details of the neighborhoods that people who would consider self, themselves to live in Chicago, where they actually might live. So we looked at a series of suburbs, um, as well as urban residential areas. And then also we looked at the loop. And I think we sort of suspected, we had the hypothesis that the loop would be uh, the, the worst performing from a restaurant traffic perspective. And that's exactly what we saw. Yeah, and we also know that closures are still pretty prominent in the loop today, even yep. right, you know, full 15 months later. But yeah. you have some suburbs that are doing way better than they were previously. Is this maybe people that used to commute into the city and no longer making that commute and now eating near home? I, I don't know what's driving that. Yeah, so Cook County as a whole, as we saw on the prior slide, still isn't back up to pre-pandemic levels, but certainly some of these outperforming suburbs are definitely helping and, and likely we're probably seeing people working from home still going out and getting lunch, coffee, dinner, all, everything. If, if anyone knows anything about Wilmette or Elk Grove, uh, please enlighten us. I just don't know those areas at all, but what's going on over there? Why are things busy these days? So uh, we're getting some nice comments in chat that a lot of people moved to those suburbs in, uh, in the last year. And that, um, and, and Wilmette in particular is a Tony suburb. I don't know, what does that mean? You know, it means I, my vocabulary is terrible. I don't know what that word means. I should. It's a nice, it's a nice way of saying nice. Rich. Oh. Is that like a snobby way of saying nice or is that a? I think it, I know, I think the opposite. Nice. I think it's a, I think it's a classy way to talk about money without talking about money. Ah, okay. Anyway, uh, we, uh, we did by, by intention, try to include uh, a mix of suburbs so not just the Tony suburbs. So hopefully you saw some of those <laughs> on the list too. Um, and what was interesting there is that both the Tony and the less Tony suburbs both seem to have similar spikes. So um, I don't think it was a money thing as much as a location thing, which is cool. Uh, it's what we're, you know, one of the great values of the data. So then we wanted to look at what was happening if you were commuting to the loop. So many offices are open, our office is open, and folks who, on our team who want to go and work in the office are able to do so. Um, and if they do, um, and if anyone uh, who's going to any of the businesses in the loop does do that, are they behaving normally? So this is the distribution of visits by time of day. So we're not worrying about how many visits we're getting. We're just looking at, are they the same as they were before the pandemic? And so you notice some, a little bit of a gap in the morning commute. So maybe people are taking it a little bit more leisurely in terms of coming to work or skipping the coffee. Um, and you also see some gaps around happy hour come, that show up that might be because there are fewer colleagues in the office. But when we look on the next slide at the raw traffic, at the actual traffic numbers, you start to see the real disparity. Yeah, if I could add something, it is sort of interesting because you know if you suck away all the people that are just coming in for uh, the commuter or, or business, you still have some people left over that live in or around the area. It's a small population, but there are some people and you start seeing what happens, right? So you don't have that morning commute nearly as much. You don't have the happy hour you talked about, but you have a spike relatively speaking for dinner and for late night, because it's not daytime traffic that's driving everything anymore. It's all that remaining sort of residential. I don't know, maybe just people like hanging around and, you know, just- Some degree of tourism, I'm sure too. A lot tourism, of them are yeah. centered, centered in that area. Uh, so let's go to the other slide, which is actual hard traffic, not distribution, but actual number of visits and what's yeah. happening. So when we look at actual number of visits, we see the disparity. We see why we got a 62. Um, so we understand that if they're there, people seem to be behaving mostly normally, um, but not that many people are there. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty big change. But you know, you can see the parts of day that are really most hampered, right? It's if you can't if you're banking on that morning commute traffic for your business, uh, you're getting hammered in the loop right now. And if you're doing more dinner time business. Uh, you are relatively more okay, right? You, you didn't lose nearly as much. Uh, the separation isn't nearly as big. In fact, it's probably even better at late night than it used to be or about the same. 
So let's zoom back out a little bit. We've gone in uh, pretty locally. And again, the thing that we just saw for the loop, you will see in uh, uh, you know, similarly aggressive stories, but maybe in a different direction in other parts of the country, every, other local neighborhoods as well. It really is a local thing, but we wanted to pull things out and look at something national again for just a moment. And let's take a look at what's happening based on the type of restaurant, if it's a chain or an independent. And this is so interesting, right? So we're looking at market share again. What percentage of all visits are to national chains, regional chains, micro chains, or independent or, or independents? Micro chains are, you know, the small, you know, super regional local chains, you know, two to five unit type of places. Regionals a little bit bigger in multiple regions. Then the national chains, you know, all, all over the country. It's fascinating. Every time we have an infection wave, national chain traffic uh, market share increases, and you see a dip in these other types of restaurants, most notably a dip among independents. That said, independents have largely um, recovered now to where they were at the beginning of 2020. They're actually doing fairly well on a share basis. Um, national chains are basically about where they were. Uh, and then you can see that regional chains and those smaller micro chains are the ones that have not yet made that recovery on a share basis. But the patterns definitely change with infection waves. You can see a very clear hump um, in, in one direction or the other each time that we had a wave. Uh, how about people, Dana? What can we learn about different types of people and where they're going? Yeah, so we are able to look at people by their age and generation. And so we're able to see how their behaviors may have changed over the course of the last 15 months based on that. Um, and what you see is that early in the pandemic, millennials got more comfortable eating faster than I think other groups. Um, and you also see a really nice recovery among boomers sort of in the March, April timeframe at the end of this year. So those are the two things that I really took away was that was as sort of different and interesting. Yeah. And uh, you can sort of see that there's some correlation, right? When certain events happen, yeah, a drop in that boomer traffic or junior uh, boomer market share. And as yep. vaccination came in, you start to see it pick right back up again. Uh, gender, anything we could learn here? Yeah, I I don't know. I thought this one was really interesting that um, that women in the winter gain so much share or maybe men cut back on visits. It's hard to say, um, but it, it was interesting how tight uh, these two got to each other this past winter. Yeah, and they've since diverged. So it seems like um, as things started opening back up, we started getting back to something that's a little bit more close to that historic norm. Um, but you can see there's still a divergence, right? If we look at generations or we look at gender, uh, January 2020 versus basically just a few days ago, there has been some longstanding share change in who's actually going to restaurants, uh, right? Gen Z, millennials have gained share. Women, women have still net gained share, right? Not as much as they were at the height, but still more so than they were in Jan 2020. Uh, so I wonder if that's going to bring about, you know, a change in the types of restaurants or menus that we see. We know there's very dramatic differences between what Gen Zers and millennials like to eat versus what boomers like to eat. Uh, one of the most boomer centric foods we've seen in our data that millennials and Gen Z are not as crazy about are egg salad sandwiches, for instance. You know, maybe that's not going to be as popular uh, anymore. Who knows? But there's been a change in where people are going and who those people are as well, even today. So here's a little bit of a quiz uh, or a game. I don't, is it trip? Tri what, what's the right word for this? Uh, riddle? I don't know. It's a, a riddle game quiz trivia. It's not really a quiz because you weren't expected to know this. But this is a chart of national brands. And I think, Dana, the way we define this are these are brands that have a national presence, restaurants, coffee houses, you know, dessert places, um, anything that is nominally a restaurant or something very close to a restaurant. Yes, as and, defined by our Firefly rules to that yes, effect. As, as we catalog in Firefly, which sort of catalogs all of that. Um, one of these has grown in traffic to a 300 plus index um, since the beginning of last year. This includes both traffic to its existing stores as well as new stores that have opened up. So collectively a, a 300 index plus. 
Uh, who here can guess what brand that is? And maybe I'll give the clue that the to be a national chain, you don't have to have thousands of units. I believe you have to have over 50 units. Right, but you have to be in multiple markets. Multiple markets and over 50 units. So we're getting a lot of really big brand guesses. It's hard yeah, to so go that, there it's hard there to there that percentage. Unless so 300 means you would have tripled your traffic. So it's yeah. really hard to do that if you're a giant chain with it's thousands. It's really of hard to do that anyway, I think. It's really hard <laughs> to do that, yeah. it's. You do that if you're Bitcoin or something. So what's the Bitcoin of, of restaurant brands? I did, uh, see, I did see at least one person get it right, although the answers are coming in real fast. So I might have missed if more people got it. You want to uh, give me one clue, David? Yeah. Should we, do, should we do one clue? Oh, somebody did get it. Oh, someone did. OK. Yeah. I well, just uh, They were going by real fast, but we got yeah. one correct guess. You know who that person is? You want to call oh, them let out? Me, let, me, let me scroll back. Chris. Lensmeyer. It is uh, that brand. Uh, Chris, congratulations. You are the winner of absolutely nothing in this case, other than our recognition and uh, the adoration of everyone else on this webinar. But that brand is actually Crumble Cookies, which has grown dramatically during that time. And um, if you're not familiar with the brand, it's a cool cookie concept. It's very sort of automated. They've really embraced automation where you sort of order the kiosk. That's part of the normal ordering. Um, experience, super easy, feels very, very high tech. And you get a really nice box of cookies with beautiful packaging. Um, but we learn a lot, right? This GPS data that we're using that we're then um, enhancing with Firefly tells us quite a lot about any brand. And we'll look at just Crumble in this one particular example. What do you wanna, uh, what can you share with us, Dana? Yeah, so obviously we saw their overall traffic growing. Um, as professionals, we sort of know that you don't get there just simply by more people coming to your store. You also have to be adding stores in the period. So they were, of course, adding stores over the course of, of the last 15 months. And so on the top left side of this slide, we're looking at their traffic per store. So per store that that diners could go in and get cookies at, um, was their traffic also growing? And so if you remember all the charts we've shown in this presentation, most of them have a hideous dip. Um, and then and then a sort of slowish recovery. Uh, you see there very much more moderate dip. Um, and then you start to see some real growth. And this is on a per store basis. So as they're adding stores, they're adding traffic per open store as well. So you see a really strong recovery there. Uh, from a gender perspective, they seem to be perfectly split down the middle, um, which uh, I think we, we were debating whether or not that makes sense for cookies, but um, you know, I love, I, I actually go there. Uh, but myself. then Jack admitted that he goes there all the time. So I th we think it's exactly right. <laughs> um, and they're getting a huge percentage of millennials. Some comments in chat about taking your kids there sort of makes sense um, as well. And um, for any uh, more sweet or, or more indulgent food, it does make sense that the traffic is spiking towards the weekend. So Fridays and Saturdays. And Salt Lake City is their highest traffic market among many so we just show the yeah. top five okay. well that seems to be where where their heritage is so it makes sense that they are beloved in their hometown i did not know that so i think we have do we have a couple minutes left if so i'm gonna oh yeah we have a couple minutes left this will be interesting so i guess uh we wanted to see if we could either um confirm a truth or debunk a myth and uh i'll let you all decide where this one ends up shaking out so at the start of the pandemic last year, we saw a number of headlines uh, like this, that you know, no one's going to Chinese restaurants anymore uh, because, I don't know, uh, prejudice, racism, who knows, right? But you saw all sorts of headlines and some even much more aggressive than this. And we started saying, is this actually true? And uh, we could actually share the data with you and, and see exactly what has happened. Uh, I didn't mean to call out Tampa over here. That just happened to be a random Tampa headline, but that was not intentional, Dana. So I apologize for that. Um, here's the actual traffic to Chinese restaurants expressed as market share. So um, in January, uh, as well as February of last year, so if you take sort of that pre-COVID period, January in the first couple of weeks of February, uh, the, uh, the market share for Chinese restaurants versus all of the restaurants is about 2.6%. And then you can see where that market share line has sort of you know, gone up or gone down 
during that time, dipping to a low of 2.35, which is about, you know, 10% uh, lower, you know, than the 2.6 to a high of 2.68 at some point, and today sitting right around 2.4. Uh, not a dramatic shift, I would say. A little bit of a shift, but not super dramatic. And we've sort of then said, well, what if you split this out between, you know, Chinese chain restaurants, right, your P.F. Chang's and, and whatnot, uh, and Chinese independent restaurants, which might be more like the place that Dana, you went to on Christmas, um, as an example. And what do those numbers look like? What was the pre-COVID share? What was the absolute high that it got to during COVID? What was the absolute low? And what's the current number um, that it's at right now? And how much does it change? And what is that index to? Uh, on average, you know, the total drop was at minus 0.21%. You see at the top, which is a 92 index, roughly. And you can see it's a 97 index for Chinese chain restaurants compared to where we were prior to the pandemic and an 87 index for Chinese independents. It to me, and look, I think all of this is open to interpretation, but I'm gonna make a case for why this looks this way to me, does not look like there is a massive decline that would be deserving of some of the headlines that were circulated. And it becomes a bit more interesting when you say, well, what if we look at this not just in terms of Chinese restaurants, but how about the entire landscape of restaurants? So that same analysis, what were they doing pre-COVID on a market share basis? What was their low? What was their high? Where are they today? And what's been the net change? But for all the different types of menus that you see out there, and you can see what that final index number is. So it's actually pretty interesting, right? So Chinese is sort of more in the middle of the pack. In fact, it's sort of like that upper middle of the pack right here, uh, where if you can see my mouse moving along. But the stuff that really, really moved to the top, and you know, the example we just saw with Crumble is probably a pretty good example of this, are we had a surge in uh, market share for dessert and snack places, for sandwich deli places, for coffee, which really surprised me. But when you looked at the data, it actually totally made sense too, right? It looks like some people that um, maybe were previously getting office coffee and didn't have that much time to go out and actually get coffee someplace else, started going to actual coffee places instead because they could do that from home. Uh, burger places, uh, barbecue places, more of those traditional menu categories. But those other categories of the menu, typically those that are you know foods featured from other cuisines, for instance, um, those have not recovered on a market share basis nearly as much. It seems like it's less a story about Chinese restaurants in particular, and more a story about the really familiar comfort items and the other, which is something we predicted very, very early on, and then all of those other cuisines that are just now starting to make that recovery. But here's the point, is we're seeing not just in this data, but everything else that we've looked at, that it's those other cuisines that are most poised to continue growing from where they are today, right? People are leaving their comfort zone very clearly. And this is something we've been saying for a while that innovation truly matters. And I'm going to go back to some of the data that we fielded as people were sort of, you know, deep in the pandemic and started to think about getting out of it. What are the foods you're most excited for? It is things like Chinese food and sushi and Korean barbecue and Mexican food and a lot of foods from around the world, pho. Um, and, and the list goes on of Cuban sandwiches and the list sort of goes on and on. The list skews very, very heavily toward those you know, non-American, non sort of just traditional comfort things that you might might easily be able to get at home or at a very, very sort of, you know, uh, like traditional type of a restaurant. These are the things that will explode in uh, popularity via some pent up demand in the weeks and months ahead. And when we asked people, where do you wanna get these types of food from? You know, if you're gonna have Japanese food, you wanna get away from home, do you think you're going to just, you know, are you happy making it at home or do you have no preference? Look at the numbers for just how much more people prefer to get all these foods from around the world away from home versus at home. So as restaurant traffic continues to restore, uh, people are going to start visiting more and more these types of restaurants or at the very least getting these types of foods at other sort of varied menu restaurants or more traditional style restaurants. It's, it's why we've been saying all along that innovation really matters. And hopefully you've been doing a lot of innovation work over the last year that your pipeline is now full and it's coming to fruition and you're launching things, you know, 
this week and next week and the, and the week after that have these types of flavors from around the world because the appetite is really starting to pick up. And if you haven't been doing that motion, well, one, you should jump on it right away because that's where all of the growth is gonna be. And innovation ultimately, and we can't say this enough, is how we ultimately win. Uh, so I don't know how we did on time, but I will have one quick reminder for all of you, uh, get access to Report Pro now, that thing we looked at earlier that gives you access to a thousand different reports. You can pick the package that makes the most sense for you. And it's, you know, no longer have to think about, do I want this one or that one? Just get them all and they're there on tap. Whenever you need them, talk to your data central rep. They'll take you through all of your options. It's a great way to just have everything you need at your fingertips. And uh, we have one more webinar. Well, actually, we have many more webinars coming up, but we have one coming up in two weeks, same time, uh, 12 p.m. Central, every other Thursday, June 24th. Join us again for that. Uh, we, um, it's going to be fantastic, as always, and we look forward to seeing you there. And just wanted to say thank you as we head into the summer. I don't know, Dana, what the official start of summer is. Is there like a particular day? Are we getting close? Yeah, the 22nd? I think, it's, I think it's always the 22nd, although. Of June, yeah, right? That's spot, yeah. Yeah, so summer is going to begin before we all meet again. So uh, do some fun summer stuff, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And Dana, I'm going to keep you on for just a moment as we close things out. But thanks, everyone. You can tell I was talking faster at the end, so we didn't go too far over. But I uh, appreciate your patience, as always. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, everyone. And thank, thank you, Dana. You.